Some of them are not, but a lot of them are. Um, and just as developers, um, we can sometimes just press a single button and something happens. But behind the scenes, a hundred or a million things happen. And it can be, you don't necessarily know all those things that happen, which is great until something goes wrong. And then you end up with one of those errors that's like, sorry, an error occurred. And you have no idea why. It'd be better to know exactly what happened. And good unit tests will give you that. Um, also, unit tests allow us to design the systems that we're building before and as we're building it. Uh, and as we build it, as we're developing it, and as it's launched, we're probably going to be wanting to change things and refactor the code. And good unit tests also allow us to safely change the code without breaking anything. So that's another good reason. But we need to step back and ask ourselves, what is a unit test? So I define unit test as some code to test that one piece of a system is operating as we expect it to. What is a unit? Ah, so we have to make it even more clear. There are units of different sizes. Something that tests a database is a big unit, and something that tests just a function would be a small unit. In general, it's good to focus on the small. Small, <coughs> why smaller systems are easier to understand. And also, WordPress itself is a really big unit. And it would be kind of nice to be able to test our plugins without WordPress. And this is uh, kind of a, maybe a controversial point, but we can make your decisions based on the rest of this talk. So, let's see if we can do that. But first of all, uh, just to know that you might not really need unit tests. It really depends on what you're developing. These are guidelines, this is my opinions, so, you know, uh, use your best judgment. On the other hand, if you're not sure, it can't really hurt to have a few unit tests. It, it can definitely improve your code. So, uh, so let's dive into this a little bit. All right, let's go back to that question. What is a unit test? Unit tests check the output for a given input. Output, input. Input, output. Um, so what is testable code? Because we're trying to write testable plugins, right? So testable code is code that makes it easy to test those inputs and outputs in isolation. Still with me? Isolation is the hard part. Most code has dependencies and it has side effects, especially WordPress code. <laughs> Let's talk about those a little bit. Dependencies. Dependencies are when a code's input is not just in the arguments. So um, it's kind of like if you uh, if you ask your friend to make you some pad thai, and uh, you probably get something edible one way or another. But maybe your friend isn't such a good cook. So if you end up not liking the food that you're eating, how can you tell what went wrong? You just say, uh, I didn't like that, but your friend's already left, so you have no idea what's going on. Or they just don't remember what they did. So dependencies, um, defining your dependencies is important. If you say, I want Pad Thai, versus, I want Pad Thai made with the following list of ingredients, then you have a little bit more control, and that's better. You can also say, I want Pad Thai made with the following list of ingredients ordered from this store using this recipe. And that's very specific. And that gives you a lot more control. So those are dependencies you're defining, rather than leaving them up to the code to just sort of figure it out. So let's talk more about dependencies. One thing we want to do is reduce dependencies. We're trying to isolate the inputs and outputs. So this is, this is when your code's input is not in the arguments. So to isolate, to help reduce the dependencies, we can do a couple of things. First of all, you can pass input to the functions themselves rather than having the functions fetch the inputs. I'm going to have examples for this later, so these abstract ideas don't make sense, just bear with me. Another thing you can do is put dependencies in variables that have to be overridden. So, if you can read it, can you read this code? Yeah? Okay. So, um, and this, again, you can look at these slides later if you want. At the top, we have a function uh, that is called update post status. And uh, it takes a post ID 
ID, you pass a post ID, it fetches the post from the database, changes the post status to publish, and then updates the post to the database. Now, I know that there's other ways to do these sorts of things, this is just contrived examples, but... Um, uh, so it's doing a few things there. However, it's doing, it's doing two database accesses. It's doing the first one to get the post from the database, and it's doing the second one to update the post again in the database. The second version at the bottom, same function update post status, but this time we first get the post ourselves, pass it to this function, and the function just takes, just takes a post object, and then it just does the rest of the stuff that needs to be done, updates the post status, and then updates the post to the database. So we've reduced the dependencies of this code by one. No longer does it have to go fetch the post itself, we already fetch it and pass it to the function. Well, that's reducing the dependencies by passing the inputs directly. Here's another uh, example of dependency. Um, at the top, we have a class called MyPlugin. It has a function update post status, same sort of thing. But this time, we're outsourcing the updating work to another class called Updater. And it's uh, some magic class that does the work for us. So when you call update post status, you pass a post ID. Uh, it creates a new updater and then updates the post. Great. It's super convenient. It works really well. But, uh, the bottom version, you see that it has a dependency on that updater class. So the bottom version, uh, same plugin file, uh, and there's at the bottom there's still update post status, same function. Uh, it takes a post ID and it calls the update post from the updater, same thing. But this time, redefine the updater as an instance variable in the class. So that if we want to, we can override it. And then this is one way to do it. I used a ternary to, uh, to update, uh, to, to assign the variable when the constructor happens. There's other ways to do that, but basically this allows us to override that value later if we want to. So allowing dependencies to be overwritten this way is called dependency injection. If you look into testing a lot, you'll see that term thrown about a lot. So that's what it means. It just allows dependencies to be overwritten. Tests uh, can isolate one part of the code from another, because you want to isolate it, to test it by replacing the dependencies. So, that's dependencies. We'll go back to that in a minute, but let's talk about side effects, the other thing. Side effects are when a code's output is not just in its return value. So we want to reduce side effects. How can we do that? We can reduce it by having each function just do one thing and by making more specific classes and functions. So at the top we have a function called update post data. It takes a post, it updates it to published, and then it sets the excerpt of the post to be the first 140 characters of the post content. Then it updates the database for that post. So the thing is that it's doing three different things there. It's setting the post to published, setting the excerpt, and publishing the post. We can break that up instead into three different function calls. So in the bottom version, we have, if you start sort of at the bottom where the functions are being called, we call update post status, we pass it the post, and that all that function does is it sets the post status to publish and returns it. The second version, the second, then, then we pass that same data, now with the publish status, to update post excerpt, which then sets the excerpt, and that's all that it does. Very specific. And finally, we call update post. Now, one thing that might be unclear here is the top version, often people think about, oh, it's super convenient. We just call one function, it does three things. That's the whole point of automation and programming, is to have convenience functions. Well, you can still have a convenience function in the bottom one. Just take those three lines at the bottom and put them into a function. But this way, they're still broken up. You have sort of the individual pieces, and then you have the wrapper of the convenience function, which does the pieces for you. That means that you can test each of those pieces. In fact, maybe even you might want them in separate classes, but we'll talk more about that later. <coughs> so I came up with some uh, precepts about when I write test, when I write code to make it testable. Um, and I'm going to listen here. I, I didn't want to say rules because all of these are guidelines. They're things you don't want to obey like strictly. You just have to think about them in each case about what's going to be useful for you. But I'll explain each one, so we'll go through. First precept, always use classes, never global functions. This is something that WordPress itself is not very good at, but it's getting better. Um, so this is pretty simple, pretty simple precept at the top. 
we have, let's say this is a shortcode plugin called other pages, and we have a function that it calls, and we call it other pages add shortcode. Pretty clear. But it's in the global namespace. So risky. Um, the bottom version, same thing, but we create a class. We call it other pages, and then we have a public instance function called add shortcode. Much better, much more testable. So you have one class to do one thing. And don't be afraid of writing too many classes or too many functions in your classes. Um, I mean, you could certainly have overkill, but it's... Most, most developers I've talked to and most code that I've written myself, it, and you, you really you end up writing too few classes because you're kind of just like, oh, it's too many files, I can't have that many files, too many classes. Don't worry about it, just write more classes, it'll make everything easier. <laughs> so when two classes interact, why do you have all these classes? When two classes can interact, we can place a mock. What is a mock? Let's go back uh, to, um, to my pad tie example. Um, using mocks is like, so you remember you asked your friend to make you pad tie? Uh, and you gave, you gave him the phone number of a store to call to order the ingredients for that pad tie. So you really defined your dependencies. So your friend is going to call that phone number. Well, using a mock is like asking the store to only sell your friend a particular brand of noodles when he calls. So that after, afterwards, after you, he cooks the dish and you eat the pad thai, if it still tastes bad, you, you know it's not because he got the wrong noodles. So mocks, also called stubs sometimes, there's slight differences, but basically the same thing, are fake objects or functions that behave in a way we can control. So we ask the store to do something different than they normally do because we want to test something. There's lots of ways to make mocks, but I'm going to suggest a library called spies which is something that I wrote, so this is me plugging myself. But I think it's really helpful. You can decide for yourself. There's other ways you can do it. Um, and uh, that's the URL. It's also at the end of the slides. So. so here's some code at the top, which is getting input from a function dependency. The fun there's a function called get the content. What do you think it does? <laughs> you pass it a post ID, and it returns the content of that post. Pretty simple. Um, at the bottom, we have a test this is a PHP unit test that, um, that uses a mock that mocks get post to return a specific post. In fact, it's a fake post. It's not even real. But it's close enough to a post to, for the function to work. And then we can assert, we can verify that the result is correct. It's what we expect. So, and what's great about this test is it will run entirely without WordPress. You don't need WordPress at all. This function can be tested just by itself. Here's a little bit more complex example. At the top we have a plugin, which a plugin class, which um, has a function called get data content. Uh, similar sort of thing. It's going to call a get post to get the content and return it. But this time it's getting the content from some magical other object called a getter. Uh, and that getter is going to you know do something and figure out the post. Um, but this is very similar to what we did in dependencies. We, we, uh, we don't instantiate the getter right when we need it. We instantiate it during the constructor so we can override that dependency, do dependency injection. Um, and at the bottom, there's a test for it. We create a mock object, a fake object, and uh, that's going to be our getter. We uh, mock the method inside that object. We pass the mock method to the plugin to inject the dependency. We call the function. And we verify that the result is what we expect. Again, all without WordPress. Precept two: Don't use static functions, except as generators. Why are static methods risky? Because they cannot be mocked. For some reason, I thought that was really fun. <laughs> um, so uh, they they can actually be mocked, but it's really hard and. I mean, you know, you can go through the work to do it, but it's a real pain. And if you just don't do it, you'll just save yourself so much headaches. So here's an example. This is an example of a generator. Uh, so static generators are okay. A generator is like a function that re that's a static function, but it returns an instance of the class. You've probably seen them in some WordPress plugins for a function called get instance, which happens a lot. And sometimes they're singletons and sometimes they're not, but it doesn't really matter. Um, static generators are okay because all they're doing, basically, is creating an instance of the class and passing it back to you. You can test that the class gets created yourself, so you don't really need to test the generator. So it's not so bad. Um, generators are actually a type of function 
uh, that is a kind of static function that you can test because they have no dependencies and no side effects. So any static function which just does some simple computation, uh, it's, it just takes its arguments and returns a value, those you can make static and it's okay. But if you're not sure, just don't make it static. Precept three, use instance variables as constants. Instance variables can be changed during runtime to produce different results for testing. So at the top here, we have a function get data, which reads some data from a file. And we define where the file is with the define statement in PHP. And there's advantages to using define statements, but testing is not one of them. <laughs> um, and it's easier instead the bottom version, which is the same thing, except that we define the directory as an instance variable. If we really wanted to, we could, some, we could inject that instance variable from a define somewhere else. But at least if it's an instance variable, we can override it. Why would you want to override it? Well, when you're testing this, when it's on a server in production, you, you might want the data directory to be in one place. But when you're testing it, you probably want the data directory to be somewhere else, somewhere fake, somewhere that's not accessing real data. So you want to override it. Precept four, use filters to pass data indirectly. So it's better, in general, if you're passing data between classes and functions, to pass it directly from one function to the next function. I call this, here's my post. You know, I get the post, I pass it to this function, I get the post back, I do something else with it. But sometimes you need to pass data indirectly by getting it at one point and then at a later point using it. And WordPress itself does this all the time. So in those cases, um, you should use a WordPress filter, because filters can be mocked. Also for fun, right? Um, so, uh, Actually, this is one of my favorite things about WordPress is because uh, you can mock filters. So anytime there's a filter in the code, it's much easier to test that code. Here's an example of using a filter. Uh, so we have a function called override post title. Uh, and what do you think that does? It overrides the post title to return uh, something else, the string something else. Um, and the bottom, oh, and, and below that, we have a function called get post title, which then applies that filter to, uh, to a post title. <coughs> so normally the function get post title will return the post title that you, of the post that you pass it. With the override post title filter in there, it will override that to return a different string. So we can write a test to test each of those parts. At the bottom, I, all I did, because there's not enough space on the slide, I wrote a test to test the second function. So we can, um, we can write a test to make sure that the filter is applied correctly. So in the test, I mock the function, apply filters. When it's called with the arguments we expect, we return foobar. And then we call the function and make sure that it's foobar. So very simple. And it makes sure that that filter is applied correctly. Or that the filter exists at all. If I took out that filter, that apply filters line, if I just change it to return post title, this test would fail. And we know that it's broken. <coughs> Use verbs in all function names. So you might, this one might be a little controversial. Isn't that just style? You know, coding style? I don't think so. I think a function name should tell you exactly what the inputs and the outputs are for that function. There's some great verbs that are really easy to add to functions, like get and is and update, create, remove, delete. Um, there's lots of others. So here's an example. Let's say you're writing a shortcut. Um, pretty simple thing to do in WordPress. You, add, you call the function add shortcode, and you pass it the shortcode name, and then you pass it the function that's going to handle that shortcode. So what do we call the function? Well, we could call it my shortcode. That's fine. It works. But it doesn't really say what it does. Other version, process my shortcode. Now that's better. It has a verb, process. It's doing something. It's doing some work with the shortcode. It's pretty clear, right? But you could still do even better because that doesn't really tell you what the function returns. And if you didn't really understand short codes fully, you might not grasp that function. Instead, how about something like get markup from short code? Because really, that's what the function does, right? You pass it a short code, and it returns markup. Something like that. Depends on your short code. Maybe. But this is, this is an example of using better function naming to make the code more clear. And if you have trouble doing that, you might want to consider splitting your function into multiple functions because your function probably does too much. So it's a good sign when you're struggling with that to be like, 
maybe this function or this class does more than I expect it to, or more than it's easy to understand. Which leads us to precept six, another controversial one. Keep functions below eight lines and indentation below four levels. Oh, WordPress. <laughs> um, why? Because shorter functions are easier to understand. Bugs creep up when you have code that's harder to understand, and shorter functions have less bugs. There's some tools you can use to do this in PHP. If you use the functions array map, array filter, array reduce, and similar things, instead of using while, for, and for each, you're going to save yourself some code and make things clearer, hopefully, along the way. So at the top, here's an example called get, get recent post titles. You pass it some posts, it gets all the recent versions of those posts and returns the post titles of each of those posts. So it does it in this, this function, which actually does obey this law, because it's uh, several lines, I think. Um, and it does it uh, by doing for each loop, so it loops over each of the posts, it checks the time of each post, gets the post title of the ones that, it, that are recent, and then it returns the, all of those titles that it's collected. It makes sense, actually. It's a good, good function. But let's look at the very bottom version. Uh, same thing, we have a function called get recent post titles. But this time it's only two lines long. How do we do that? Well, we do do two things. The first one, we call array filter on a new function called is post recent. So is post recent very specific. What does it do? It tells you if the post is recent or not. It's, it's actually one line. Very easy to test. So uh, that will get rid of all the posts that aren't recent. So now we have an array of posts that are recent. And then we pass those to another function called get post title. That one, all it does, return the post title. Very easy to test. And then it returns all those posts, post titles. So same thing, much easier to test those three functions in that one function. And probably fewer bugs. Preset seven. Consider all possible inputs and outputs. So if you check for errors from external functions, now hopefully all of you plugin authors and theme authors are doing this already, but maybe not. I've seen a lot of code where this is not the case. When you're testing, or especially in testing, but also in real life, your data might be missing or incomplete. So in the version, in the, uh, version of the code here at the top, we have a function called getPostTitle. It gets a post and returns the post title. But if you look at the documentation for the function getPost, it can sometimes return false if the post doesn't exist or it doesn't fetch it for some reason. Um, and so a better version is to test to make sure that, it's, that it exists before we try, trying to return the post title. You're likely to avoid any errors. You might even be able to add an error logging or error reporting in some way so that you know that this is happening and provide a good error to your users. Um, some error is better than no error. Errors aren't great, but it's better to know what's going on than not know what's going on. Plus, if you're testing this and you mock get post, it's not necessarily going to return the values you expect. So this way, you're sure that you're getting something. You can even go further to make sure that the post title itself exists. There's a lot of ver verification. But at least test your inputs and outputs. Preset 8. Whenever possible, write your tests first. Tested code gives us confidence because that it'll work the way that we expect because we've defined our expectations. And therefore, it can be refactored safely. So if you later want to go in and change how your code works, make it more efficient, make it faster, make it better in some ways, if you have tests in place, you can be sure that it's going to do the things that you expect, no matter how you change your code. And if it doesn't, you'll know about it, and you'll be able to go and fix it. Preset 9. Don't test the code from other libraries, but test the inputs and outputs from those libraries. So we can assume, probably, that WordPress works. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have bigger problems. But we should make sure that we, in our plugins and themes and such, are using WordPress the way that we think we are. So we can test the inputs to external functions with spies. What is a spy? A spy is an object that behaves like a function, in which we can query to learn how it was called. Remember, Pat, remember the Pad Thai guy? So, um, using spies is kind of like giving your friend who's going to give you Pad Thai your phone number instead of the store's phone number. So that then when he calls to order noodles, 
he calls you, and you pretend to be the store. And you can verify that he's ordering the right kind of noodles. So if he calls you, and he orders beet noodles instead of rice noodles, you know you found a bug with your friend's recipe. That's basically what the spy is. So you do a thing that calls a method, and then you say, hey spy, did that method get called the way we expected it to? That's a unit test with a spy. So here, in this code, we're going to use a spy to make sure a short code is added correctly. So on the top, we have a function called add my short code. Yay. It adds a short code called other pages, and it calls a function get markup from short code. Remember that one? Um, so at the bottom, we have a unit test. So again, it's a PHP unit. Um, we uh, get a spy for the function add short code. We then call the function we defined up here. And then we ask the spy, was, were you called with uh, the name other pages and then something else? And if that returns true, we know it worked. And this is a very, very simple test for with a very simple spot. You can get more complex than this to make sure it does the actual thing that you want it to do. But this is a basic use of spies. Precept 10. Write only, only one assertion per test. So this is unit testing. A unit is one thing. A unit test should test just that one thing. One functions, one input, and one output. Ideally. Can a function have more than one input or output? Probably. <laughs> most of your code probably can. A lot, most of mine can. In that case, write more than one test. There's a lot of tools and a lot of guides on how to do that. But why should we do this? Because, as written in this great article by some Google developers, which I highly recommend you read if you're interested in testing, uh, unit tests isolate failures. Even if a product contains millions of lines of code, if a unit test fails, you only need to search that small unit under test to find the bug. Whereas if you have a convenience function which is doing 10 things, or a big test that involves the WordPress database, then if something fails, you don't know if it was the WordPress database that failed, if it was WordPress that failed, if it was your SQL statement, if it was one of the hundred things that you did in that, fun in that function, or any of the functions that it calls, any of the dependencies, or any of the side effects. So, small, focus on the small. And code is hard. When you write tests, you can't possibly predict all possible situations. So, you know, do your best. And when you find a bug, before you fix the bug, unless you're really pressed for time, Try to write a test that causes the bug to happen and the test will fail. Then fix the bug so that the test passes. You'll know that you fixed the bug, you've defined your dependencies, and you will then have a safeguard in place so that that bug won't ever happen again. So this is a good way to add tests, especially to existing projects. You don't have to go in and test, write tests for everything right away. Just write tests as bugs show up or as you feel compelled to write them, or as you refactor code. So back to that question again. What is a unit test? Unit tests are confidence, safety, and readability. They are an investment in the future of your code. So I have to thank all the uh, WordPress, WordPress.com REST API test suite and all of its overworked, underappreciated maintainers for uh, being one avenue through which I learned a lot of these presets, um, as, uh, as well as a lot of my coworkers uh, developing Team Grab. Uh, and big thanks to you for uh, coming to the talk. I think hopefully this was helpful for you. These slides are up uh, on my website up there, payton.codes slash testable WordPress plugins. And uh, there's a short code, uh, there's a simple short code plugin I wrote also called Other Pages, which uh, a lot of the examples in this used. And if you just want to see a very simple short code plugin that doesn't do a lot. Uh, but uh, it has a full set of unit tests, so you can use that as an example to write your own tests. And the library I mentioned, Spies, uh, which has mocks, stubs, and spies for your unit testing, PHP. And uh, good testing, everyone.
this is very like loose and, and, uh, and lightweight device. So the question was how do you test uh, private uh, and protected methods, particularly in interface, uh, in, in uh, abstract classes where you, uh, you want to test to make sure that they work. Right? Yeah. So um, private methods, uh, basically uh, the, the rule of thumb is that private methods are uh, an, implement, impl excuse me, an implementation detail. Um, your public methods are the API of your class. So if you, um, if you call a function, a public function on a class, and it does some thing, you want to write tests for that class, all you're going to test is the public method. It might then, in turn, call a bunch of private methods, and maybe even do all kinds of crazy things. But all of those other crazy things and all of those private methods are going to have to be tested through that public interface. If you want to test some private method separately, because it's really complex, for example, which is very common, take that and put it in another class, a helper class, and make it public. But just, you know, just, you can write your documentation if you want. This is a helper class. Like, you're not meant to call these methods directly. They're for me. Um, but making them public makes it testable. But having them be private, you, there's, it's really, like, impossible to test them. Um, and uh, similar, it's basically the same answer for abstract classes. If it does something complex, um, well, there's two ways you can do it. You can put the, put the complex methods in another class, or you can, um, you can test an abstract class by uh, applying it, by, by um, subclassing it, and then test that subclass. You just make a very simple subclass for testing. Often those simple versions of data that you use in your test, those are called fixtures. So if you see uh, in unit testing, documentation that you're reading, you see somebody reference fixtures, it's usually like fake data that you're using to test your code. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? What was like the template, um, like where are you putting your test files? Is it like if you have like a function, if you're testing your functions.php, are you writing like test underscore functions.php? So um, the question was where do you what does your uh, file system look like for tests, right? Is that basically? Yeah, like what convention do you have? Sure. For, like, tools that... Yeah, what convention? What conventions do I use? Um, so, uh, if you're testing a plugin, um, which is most of what I do, uh, you probably the way I do it is I just have. Um, uh, so if, if you if, if you follow, I forget what it's called, but there's like a. a uh, PHP guideline for how to structure your file system of a, of a module. Um, and, uh, so, and in that recommendation, you use a, a directory called src source for uh, your, your class. Um, and uh, then you can make a directory called tests or test. I think I sometimes use tests and sometimes test. And, um, and under that, you put your test files. And, Ideally, you have like one test file per class file in your plugin. Um, if you have a bunch of, if you're trying to test something that's just like all in one file, like functions.php, which you mentioned, um, that uh, it doesn't really matter too much. I would put, I would just make a directory called tests. I, the PHP unit actually has a recommendation for that. I think it's tests, um, and it, and then you just you can put whatever file structure underneath that works best 